My name is Michael Mann. I'm Distinguished Professor of Meteorology and Director of the Earth System Science Center at Penn State University, and I'm a climate scientist. I study uh, the science of climate variability and climate change. Yeah, so um, you know, back in the late 90s um, when we published uh, these uh, climate reconstructions, we used proxy data. Um, these are things like tree rings and ice cores and corals um, and sediments, various natural archives, uh, physical or chemical or biological archives that tell us something about climate conditions in the distant past, farther back than we have reliable, you know, instrumental measurements. Uh, we really only have widespread thermometer measurements uh, around the globe for you know, a little over a century. But we can extend these records further back in time by using these so-called proxy data. And so back in the late 1990s, my co-authors and I uh, sought to reconstruct the surface temperature record back in time, hundreds of years back in time, using these proxy data. Now what actually drove the research was our interest in the underlying patterns of past temperature variation. Um, what was the history of El Nino in the past and its large-scale influence on the climate? What was the pattern around the world of the response to some of the, the largest volcanic eruptions of the past thousand years? Uh, these were actually the questions that drove that research. Um, and primarily an interest in natural climate variability, using these long-term records to reconstruct the history of natural climate variability in the distant past. But when we published the results, we began to realize that they had implications not just for natural climate variability, but for this now very contentious, and even back then, contentious issue of human-caused climate change. Um, these reconstructions of temperatures in the past allowed us to put the modern warming in a long-term context. And what the work showed was that the recent warming, the warming spike of the past century, really has no precedent as far back as we were able to go. Uh, a thousand years in our publication in 1999, uh, more recent studies have actually pushed uh, that conclusion back even further. Um, there's tentative evidence that the warming spike we're seeing now is unprecedented uh, over at least the last, you know, nearly 12,000 years and maybe longer. Um, but at the time, this was really the first study to definitively conclude that the recent warming really is unusual in a long-term context. Um, it wasn't the first study to conclude that we were seeing the impacts of human-caused climate change. There was work in the mid-1990s based on pattern matching between climate models and climate observations showing that the patterns matched only when you accounted for the human influence of increasing greenhouse gases. Uh, that was sort of the primary basis for the consensus that emerged in the mid-1990s that human-caused climate change was here. It was detectable. Uh, but our work uh, that led to the so-called hockey stick a curve that showed that this modern warming spike was unprecedented over the past thousand years, um, I think was a more visual depiction how, of how unusual the changes we're seeing right now in the climate really are. Um, now, if you look at that curve, uh, what it shows is that the modern warming, warming spike is unprecedented as far back as we could go, a thousand years um, in, in our you know, 1990s studies. Um, but there were some temperature changes along the way, and there was a period of about a thousand years ago where temperatures um, you know, over the northern hemisphere were relatively warm, um, and then Temperatures cool as you slowly descend into what's sometimes called the Little Ice Age of sort of the 1300s through the 1800s. Uh, and so you have this long-term cooling from the medieval climate period into the Little Ice Age of the 17th, 18th, and 19th century, followed by this abrupt spike, which takes you outside of the range of any of that previous variation. Now, when it comes to the medieval period, uh, it used to be widely claimed that um, global temperatures were warmer then than they are today. The evidence that we have now does not bear that out. But what it shows is that there are some regions where temperatures were quite a bit warmer. Um, the, the pattern of warming and cooling around the globe isn't uniform. Um, there is a lot of sort of redistribution of heat around the globe associated with changing ocean currents, associated with changing atmospheric wind patterns. Uh, and so when you look back in time, there's a very complex, regionally diverse 
pattern of temperature changes. And what we find is that in certain regions in the North Atlantic and parts of Greenland, uh, during the height of the sort of medieval climate period, uh, may have been almost as warm as conditions today, uh, if not even warmer, within the uncertainties perhaps even warmer. But most of the globe was substantially cooler. And when you average over the globe or over the northern hemisphere, what you find was that temperatures then are not nearly as high as they are today because what's different is the sort of coherent pattern of the warming. The warming period we're seeing now isn't just a patchwork of warming in some regions interspersed with cooling in others. Essentially, the entire globe is warming up uh, in unison, and, and we don't see that in the past record. If the you know, medieval period turned out to be significantly warmer then the science seems to be telling us that it is. Um, uh, it could mean one of two different things. Uh, it could mean that the climate is much more sensitive to the relatively small driving factors that existed before the human influence. Uh, relatively small variations in the output of the sun, um, uh, volcanic eruptions uh, that uh, cool the planet for several years, um, if they're large explosive eruptions. Um, they're very small but uh, steady changes over the past thousand years in the orbital geometry of the Earth relative to the Sun. Uh, that changes very prominently on tens of thousands of year time scales, but it changes a little bit over a thousand year time scale. So there are a number of these different factors, these natural factors that we know have been driving the climate for at least a thousand years prior to the Industrial Revolution and the interval of human domination on climate. It could mean uh, that uh, the climate is much more sensitive to these natural factors and if that's true it would imply that the climate is actually more sensitive to CO2 concentrations than we currently think it is. So ironically when it comes to contrarians, uh, climate change deniers who will a wrongly claim that the medieval period was warmer than today because the science seems to definitively say otherwise now but even granting them that if that were true. And then they say, and because that's true, it means that you know, the warming today uh, could be natural too. Well, in fact, we have a pretty good idea of what the natural uh, driving factors were during the medieval period. Volcanoes, changes in solar output, uh, small changes, long-term changes in Earth orbital, um, the, or the geometry of the Earth's orbit around the sun. Um, uh, if the climate really were far more sensitive to those natural factors, it would imply that it's more sensitive to uh, CO2 increases. It would imply just the opposite of what the skeptics or contrarians or deniers uh, of climate want you to think. It would potentially imply that climate change is a worse problem than the models currently say it is. Now, it could also mean um, that uh, there's a lot more internal natural variability. There's natural variability that we call external because it's driven by specific factors like changes in solar output or volcanic eruptions. But there's also natural variability of the climate that's just a result of the chaotic, internal, oscillatory behavior of the climate. We see it on year-to-year -year time scales in the form of the El Nino phenomenon. It's just a natural oscillation. On day-to-day -day time scales, it's what we call weather. It's just a natural oscillation. It's not driven by anything specifically. And so the climate is like that on longer timescales as well. There is some internal variability. Um, the climate sort of sloshes around uh, on its own uh, because of changing ocean currents and changing wind patterns. And we've done quite a bit of work on that. Um, and what we've found is that, in fact, uh, the internal variability of the climate uh, based on all of the model simulations of what that variability is, based on analysis of the, the data that are available, the internal variability of the climate is not nearly large enough to produce anything close to the warming that we have seen this last century. And internal variability would probably not be a good candidate if you were trying to explain anomalous warmth a thousand years ago. Of course, the fact is that we don't think the warmth at the global scale a thousand years ago was anomalous. We're fairly confident now that it was not as warm then, averaging over the globe or averaging over the northern hemisphere, as temperatures are today. And we do see the fingerprint of human influence in the warming we see today. 
So it's always been somewhat ironic to me that um, uh, our work, our 1998 work and then our follow-up work, the only thing that people really focused on was this one single time series, the, the so-called hockey stick, the average temperature over the entire northern hemisphere. And as I've always said, to me, that was the most, it was the least interesting aspect of the reconstructions because it averages over a lot of interesting regional detail. What actually drove the work in the first place was an effort to understand what the patterns of temperature around the world were in the past. Um, what were the, you know, the patterns of past El Nino events and what influence did they have on climate uh, around the world? What was the pattern of the response of the climate to some of the very large volcanic eruptions, uh, eruptions much larger than anything that's documented in the modern historical record? What did the climate response to the uh, eruption of Mount Tembora in 1815, what did that look like? And what can it tell us about the dynamics of the climate and how they respond to something like a major volcanic eruption? Um, those were the sorts of questions that I thought were most interesting and that we were able to, to address with these reconstructions. Um, the least scientifically interesting thing was this single time series, the, the hockey stick curve, but of course, that's what got all of the, uh, the public attention uh, because of its implications for human-caused climate change and because it was a simple, digestible curve. You would think that, you know, if this debate were really driven by facts and logic, um, you wouldn't have uh, people still continuing to try to claim that, you know, our, the hockey stick curve is broken or discredited. Uh, you hear various uh, allegations of that sort if you go to climate change denier blogs that live sort of in an alternative universe that's free of the actual scientific facts when it comes to climate change. Um, in reality, um, the you know, study after study has not only reaffirmed our key conclusion about the unusual nature of the recent warming, um, uh, more recent work has strengthened and extended those conclusions. The most recent report of the IPCC um, concluded that uh, the recent warming is unprecedented not just in a thousand years, as we concluded you know, a decade and a half ago, but at least 1,300 years and maybe even longer, but we, we can only go back about 1,300 years with reasonable confidence given the available data. Um, the, uh, you know, I sometimes refer to what exists now when it comes to these paleoclimate reconstructions is not a hockey stick, but a hockey league. Because there are dozens of these reconstructions and they don't all agree on all of the details. You know, what, what was the coldest part of the Little Ice Age? And what was the precise pattern of the medieval climate period? Um, different studies come to different conclusions because they use different kinds of data, different methods to take those data and form a climate reconstruction. But the one thing they all agree on is that the recent warming has no precedent as far back as we can go. Um, and in fact, if you look at the most uh, prominent um, and comprehensive study of this sort that was published about a, a year and a half ago, there was a, a study published by the so-called Pages 2K Project. This is a team of nearly 80 scientists around the world using the most comprehensive data set of paleoclimate proxy records ever assembled for this sort of work and they did their own reconstruction and it turns out when you let, lay it on top of the original hockey stick the two curves are almost indistinguishable so a decade and a half later using far more sophisticated methods than the methods we used using far more comprehensive and widespread proxy data than the data we used a decade and a half ago um, that work comes to remarkably similar conclusions, and it, that's how science works. Science advances. You don't stay frozen 15 years ago. The hockey stick doesn't remain our best estimate of, uh, of temperature changes over the past thousand years. If it did, that would be a sad commentary on the lack of progress in our field. Necessarily, uh, the field has moved forward, has produced um, even more comprehensive uh, reconstructions, has reduced the uncertainties, um, has brought more sophisticated methods to the table to perform these sorts of reconstructions, um, and there's been a lot of really interesting work now comparing those reconstructions with 
uh, model simulations to see what these paleoclimate reconstructions can tell us about our future. Um, we can use them in a way to validate the models, to test the extent to which the models have the right level of what we call sensitivity to the driving factors. And to the extent we can convince ourselves that they do, it gives us more confidence that they have the right sensitivity when it comes to the impact of increasing CO2 concentrations due to human activity. We used a uh, fairly simple uh, regression uh, approach in our original work. Um, and you know, linear regression um, is a perfectly sound and appropriate statistical technique, but it has some limitations. And there are more sophisticated uh, methods, uh, statistical approaches, that can actually alleviate some of the you know, weaknesses uh, present in ordinary linear regression. And so much of that additional work, some of the criticisms of our work, had to do with, um, again, the legitimate criticisms uh, of our work, had to do with you know, potential uh, weaknesses in that method and possible improvements on that methodology, and we have taken part ourselves in publishing more sophisticated methodologies. Um, interestingly enough, even using the most sophisticated methodologies and the most widespread paleoclimate proxy data, the uh, Pages 2K team that published this you know, most comprehensive reconstruction of temperatures over the past thousand years ago, a year and a half ago in the journal of Nature Geoscience, their curve lies almost precisely on top of our original curve. So, you know, one might speculate that even though we didn't use the most sophisticated methods that one might use uh, for this sort of problem, the basic result appears to have been pretty robust. Now, there have also been some papers um, that have sort of, what I would say, slipped through the peer review process. Um, they were published in dubious journals like the journal Energy and Environment, uh, which is edited by somebody who claims that her editorial decision making is driven by her political ideology. Um, so she published a paper by some non-scientists um, from Canada, um, one of whom was pretty closely allied with uh, energy interests, uh, special interests. Um, and they made a number of really false claims about our work, uh, all of which have now been discredited, in fact, in the peer-reviewed literature, in the, in the real peer-reviewed literature, journals like uh, the AGU journals and Nature and Science. The hockey stick graph has become a, a lightning rod with climate change deniers uh, because it's iconic. Uh, it's been featured prominently. It was featured prominently in the summary for policymakers of the uh, third assessment report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. It has um, been, you know, it's become a, a symbol of climate change. And so the critics um, and, you know, the industry funded attack dogs uh, look for iconic images, um, uh, things that they can try to bring down and then claim that the entire fabric of the underlying science um, has uh, somehow uh, been undermined. Uh, so there's this tendency, for example, to try to say, well, you know, our entire understanding of climate change, our reason for accepting the existence of climate change is all based on a single 15-year-old study by Mike Mann, uh, when in fact uh, you could get rid of the hockey stick, or the dozens of independent reconstructions that come to the same conclusion as the hockey stick. You could throw all of that aside, and there would still be many independent lines of evidence that tell us that the globe is warming, the climate is changing, it's due to human activity, and it's a problem if we don't do something about it. But if you can take one single image and try to convince the public that our entire scientific understanding hinges upon that one image, then it becomes uh, very easy to set up this straw man where you undermine, you, you attack the hockey stick, often by attacking the scientists themselves, myself and my colleagues, um, trying to undermine uh, their uh, credibility, trying to question their integrity. Um, and so it gets quite nasty, and it's all part of a cynical effort to set up this straw man depiction of the science where it somehow depends completely on one 15-year-old study. It's sort of like uh, those who uh, attack the science of evolution, uh, proponents of intelligent design. Uh, they like to call 
it Darwinism. They like to call it evolution Darwinism because then it makes it about one person, one person whom you can try to vilify and attack and pretend that the entire basis for the science has collapsed because you were able to somehow undermine the public's uh, faith in that one individual. But typically the attacks are, are not really about the science. Um, uh, the attack on the science is a proxy for what is really an effort to discredit science that may prove inconvenient for certain special interests. Um, uh, people who, for example, uh, uh, feel that there's no role for regulation. Regulation is a bad thing. Well, you know, if you accept what the science has to say about human-caused climate change, um, then there will need to be regulation. We will need to be doing something about our escalating carbon emissions. And uh, there are people who don't like that. There are powerful special interests who don't like that. And so in trying to prevent the sort of prospect for regulation of carbon emissions, um, they try to discredit the case for concern. They try to discredit the science. Uh, they try to kill the messenger. Often it takes the form of an attack on individual scientists. Um, uh, there's a, a <clears throat> it's part of you know, the strategy of ad hominem attack. Um, when you can't win the legitimate argument, and make no mistake about it, the critics can't win the legitimate argument because the science is overwhelming. There's an overwhelming uh, consensus of the world's scientists that global warming is happening, climate change is happening, it's due to human activity, and it will get much worse and much more costly if we do no nothing about it. Um, you know, that's not just my view, that's not just the view of random scientists that you might run into at a scientific conference, it's the view of the U.S. National Academy of Sciences. It's the view of every national academy uh, of every industrial nation. It's the view of every scientific society in the U.S. that has weighed in on the matter of climate change. So faced with that overwhelming consensus, um, overwhelming scientific evidence, um, those who are uh, looking to forestall you know, legislation, policies to deal with climate change have decided their only hope is to somehow convince the public that despite that overwhelming scientific uh, consensus, there's still too much uncertainty to act. Of course, there's further irony to that in uh, the sense that if you talk to economists who study climate change impacts, they will tell you that uncertainty is actually a reason to act sooner because uncertainty can break in both directions. And increasingly, it looks like the uncertainties are resolving themselves in the direction of the problem being even worse than we initially thought. One of the tactics that you see um, in sort of climate change denialism is an effort to spin and misrepresent peer-reviewed scientific studies. Um, so uh, often studies that uh, say one thing, for example, show that you know, some aspect of climate change is you know, even worse than we thought will somehow be spun by climate change deniers um, as if it uh, you know, doesn't provide evidence uh, for concern. Um, uh, they will often gang up uh, on authors. Um, they will uh, bully uh, editors to try to get uh, them to retract articles that are a threat to their case, their case being that climate change isn't real, it's not something to worry about. Um, so if you're a prominent scientist, if you participate in the public discourse, as I've often said, you better uh, develop a thick skin because you will be attacked personally. Um, you will be attacked often in very mean and um, nasty uh, ways uh, because you know, you are a threat. You and your science and your message are a threat to some very powerful special interests. And so what they do is they hire a cadre of sort of attack dogs, and those attack dogs are able to sort of um, fan the flames of irrationality and hatred among a much larger sort of uh, base, a much larger uh, group of individuals uh, who are out there and you know, believe what they're being told, that climate scientists are in it for the money, that um, this is all part of a, you know, uh, a campaign to instill a 
you know, one world government to take away your freedom and liberty. Um, there are people who fall for that. There are people who, you know, have uh, difficulties or facing challenges in their lives. And they're, sometimes they're looking for a scapegoat. Um, and there are, you know, more than enough sort of, uh, you know, professional attack dogs who are out there trying to convince them that their enemy is these climate scientists who are showing that climate change is a problem. So, you know, in this uh, effort to discredit climate science in the lead up to the uh, 2009 Copenhagen summit, um, um, where, you know, various emails, including emails that were mine or were written to me, were stolen and then combed through to try to find words and phrases that, if you took them out of context, could sound, um, you know, a little questionable, could be used to try to make it sound like climate scientists were engaged in something inappropriate, were hiding something. And so that's what climate change deniers did. They combed through thousands of emails looking for even just one little short phrase that they could use to try to attack climate scientists. And one phrase that they seized upon was an email uh, to me and some other scientists from my colleague Phil Jones of the University of East Anglia, where he referred to a trick that he used in this graph that he was preparing. And as all scientists and mathematicians know, a trick is a term that's used to describe a clever solution to a problem. And here's the trick to solving that problem. Or, you know, this is a trick of the trade. We even use it that way in some of our sort of uh, popular uh, lingo as well. And what he was referring to was just a clever way to compare these paleoclimate temperature reconstructions that go back, you know, a thousand years with the modern warming shown in the instrumental record because the paleoclimate data actually don't come up to the present uh, because many of them, many of these corals and tree rings were obtained back in, you know, the 1970s or the 1980s. And so they don't come up to the present. So if you want a complete depiction of what's happening, um, you wouldn't stop at 1980. You would also show what we know happened since 1980, because we do have thermometer records uh, since 1980. And so that's what he was doing, finding a way to show both pieces of information together so that you got the whole picture. Um, this was for the cover of a government report. It was for non-experts. So he wanted to simplify this as much as possible so that to an uninformed you you know, uh, reader, it would convey in a simple way what we know about long-term temperature changes. And, and, the, and, and, and so he was just referring to something that was completely legitimate. And in fact, the journal Nature even commented on this after the stolen emails and after you know, professional industry-funded climate change deniers were busy using this to try to malign the entire science of climate um, going into the Copenhagen Climate Summit. Um, as all that was going on, uh, the journal, you know, arguably the most you know, distinguished scientific journal um, in the world, uh, the journal Nature, um, with a very austere, very conservative editorial board, weighed in quite you know, uh, definitively and passionately about how climate change deniers were intentionally misrepresenting scientists by implying that the use of the word trick was in any way nefarious. Um, it was very clear by the context that what they were talking about was something that was completely appropriate. Um, but that's sort of what you have when you're left without a legitimate argument for your case, which is where we ha what we have in the case of climate change denial today. All you've got to turn to, apparently, is innuendo and obfuscation and misdirection. And this was just another example of that. Uh, what the critics also tried to do is to take two different phrases from the same email that appear at opposite ends of a very long sentence and splice them together. So you actually heard people, there were people out there claiming that the email talked about uh, using a trick to hide the decline, using Mike's trick to hide the decline. The email doesn't say anything of the sort. The hide the decline is referring to something else later in the sentence, what uh, Phil Jones was talking about was that one particular climate reconstruction that was shown in his comparison uh, that had been performed by uh, Keith Briffa um, and colleagues uh, at the University of East Anglia. Um, they had used 
uh, density, the density of the rings of trees. So you can use tree ring uh, growth thicknesses to tell you something about climate. But it turns out that if you look at the density of the wood that grows in any particular year, that also tells you something about temperature. And so they had performed a reconstruction of temperatures uh, using exclusively these tree ring density measurements. And for various reasons that have been explored for you know, now uh, nearly two decades, um, these particular measurements track temperatures very well um, until about 1960 and then they begin to diverge. Um, the thermometer measurements tell us very clearly that the globe warmed substantially since then, but the tree ring data stop, the tree ring densities that they used, stop sort of reflecting that uh, warming. And uh, at the time, in fact, before that um, email ever was written, they had published a year earlier a paper in the journal Nature talking about this problem it was hardly something that was hidden or nefarious. Uh, they were well aware of this problem, and they stated very clearly in that paper in 1998 that because of this problem, you should not use the post-1960 data to depict temperature changes. Um, and so what Phil Jones was talking about in that email was he was hiding, all he meant was not misleading the readers of this report by showing them this very misleading um, post-1960 tree ring density data because they wrongly convey what was actually happening with temperatures. And we have thermometer measurements that tell us what actually happened with temperatures. So he was literally saying, for this simple graphic that's supposed to convey to this lay audience what we know about temperatures over the past thousand years, let's not show this bad data that will confuse them and mislead them. Uh, but somehow that was parlayed once again into something nefarious, something inappropriate by you know, some very cynical bad faith actors who were you know, using this misdirection and confusion really as a distraction to make sure that there were no meaningful negotiations and dealing with climate change at the upcoming uh, Copenhagen summit in 2009. Mm -hmm. So you really need to distinguish in science between the legitimate give and take uh, and legitimate criticism, which is a critical thing in science. It's part of the self-correcting machinery that sort of keeps science on a path towards a better understanding, towards scientific truth. And so we rely on real skepticism. In, that takes the form uh, in the peer-reviewed literature. You publish a paper, um, it's got to be reviewed. It goes to several experts, typically anonymously in the field, um, who you know, will determine whether or not you've made your case. Uh, and if they determine you have, it gets published. But it doesn't stop there, because um, some other scientists may see that paper. They may um, disagree with the conclusions, they may disagree with the method that was used or the data was used, and they may publish a response or they may publish uh, follow-up work, and you may publish a reply to that, trying to put um, the, the work you had done in uh, that additional context. And, and so that's sort of the legitimate give and take that occurs in science, it, it occurs in the peer-reviewed scientific literature, it occurs at scientific meetings like the one that we're at, where scientists present uh, their findings and then members of the audience can ask them questions um, about that work, about their work. So we have to distinguish between that, that legitimate give and take, and it can sometimes be contentious. It can be very contentious. Uh, my uh, uh, you know, good friend and, and sadly you know, no longer uh, with us uh, colleague Steve Schneider you know, once characterized science as a full contact sport, and, and that's not a bad description. Um, sometimes you know, our detractors will tell you, well, you know, this is just a love fest. All we're trying to do is reaffirm each other's uh, work, uh, demonstrating that global warming is real because that's what brings all the grant money coming in. Nothing could be farther from the truth. The way you get ahead in science is by distinguishing yourself from everyone else, by finding something new, by showing that everyone else was wrong. That's how you really make a name for yourself in science. The incentives are precisely the opposite of what our detractors would claim. Um, so let's distinguish between that. That's all good and it's really important. And what I would call bad faith um, sort of uh, attacks on science, which you know, have a different nature to them. Uh, typically, they're not published in the peer-reviewed literature. They're published on blogs. Um, and they're not published by scientists with expertise in the field. They're published by, tip, 
typically, you know, often people with an ax to grind, people who have an ideological view that the regulation of carbon emissions is a bad thing, and so we have to disprove the underlying scientific reason for it, and we do that by going after scientists. Um, typically, in those sorts of attacks, rather than the reasoned uh, argumentation that you would see in a peer-reviewed uh, publication or in a scientific lecture, um, you'll be subject to rhetorical approaches to you know, confusing the audience, um, to muddying the waters, um, rather than the as, you know, aspects of the scientific work being specifically criticized, typically you'll find the criticism to be ad hominem. You know, this is a bad person, he or she's a mean person, we can't trust this person. Um, and so in the case of the hockey stick, uh, we have seen both. There have been legitimate uh, sort of critiques that we've responded to. We have critiqued our own work, um, and the field has moved well beyond where it was a decade and a half ago. Um, and so, you know, we have been active participants in the effort to move beyond our original work and to even, in some cases, clarify the caveats and weaknesses in some of our original work as we move forward, as other scientists move forward. And that's how science moves forward. Um, and, you know, we're now in a stronger position with the most recent IPCC report. Um, uh, the IPCC expressed even greater confidence now, given the many different studies, uh, many of them even more comprehensive, that the recent warming that we're seeing really is unprecedented as far back, uh, not just a thousand years, probably 1,300 years at least, and maybe even further. Um, so that's all sort of legitimate, you know, progress, scientific progress, give and take, and it's involved criticism, and criticisms we've replied to, criticisms we've made of other scientists, and replies that they've made, and that all has helped the science move forward, and it's a good thing. Uh, but, you know, the bad faith attacks by people driven by ideology, by politicians in the pay of fossil fuel interests, by industry-funded front groups and their attack dogs, um, the attacks like, you know, uh, of that sort, aimed at discrediting me as a person or discrediting my co-authors or questioning the integrity of me, my colleagues, or even the entire climate science community. Uh, there's no place for that in legitimate scientific discourse. Uh, and, uh, you know, sadly, I have had to deal with that as well. Yes, in, in my book, uh, The Hockey Stick and the Climate Wars, um, I coined a term, the Serengeti strategy, um, and it harkens back to an experience that I had uh, when I was working on the third assessment report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change um, back in the late 1990s. And I was at a conference um, t towards the uh, latter stages of uh, the writing of the report in Arusha, uh, Tanzania, where we went on a safari. Um, once we were done with uh, the scientific work we were there to do, um, we took a half-day uh, safari into the uh, Serengeti Plain um, in one of those, you know, buggies uh, that allows you to really, you know, drive through the wilderness and, 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 and get up close and personal with, you know, magnificent animals like lions and zebras and giraffes, uh, hyenas. And one of the, the scenes that I saw um, on that day uh, was this sort of wall of zebras standing back to back and forming an almost continual uh, wall of stripes. And our tour guide explained that what they were doing <coughs> was creating this seamless sort of um, continuous pattern that is unidentifiable as a zebra. Um, and it's a way of protecting yourself against attack. Um, you stay with the pack, you blend into the pack. The zebras, you know, th those zebras are safe. Um, the, the lions won't see them and they won't pursue them. It's going to be those zebras who stray from the pack, who find themselves off out alone, who are going to be vulnerable to attack by the lions. And so I used that analogy in my uh, book to describe the phenomenon whereby 
you know, professional climate change uh, deniers, industry-funded attack dogs, um, and the facilitators uh, will look for individual scientists who have been separated by the PAC, who have published a very prominent study and are getting a lot of focus and attention. And they'll go after them and they'll try to bring them down just like the lions try to bring that zebra down to intimidate them, to try to send a message, to stop doing what you're doing, stop trying to communicate, you know, the your research and the implications of your research to the public because it's a threat to, to the, the fossil fuel interests. Um, and it's to send a message to other would-be science communicators that if you do this, uh, we're going to come after you too. Um, it's an insidious uh, sort of strategy that is used in the you know, larger campaign to deny climate change. Uh, you know, I personally have been subject to all sorts of attacks uh, from nasty letters and emails, uh, not just calling me uh, you know, bad names, but uh, making uh, thinly veiled threats against my safety, against my life, uh, making thinly veiled threats uh, to my family. Um, I have uh, received uh, letters in the mail um, and that in one case contained a white powder that I had to actually report to the FBI. They had to come to my office and investigate this and send this off to a lab to make sure that um, you know, it wasn't anthrax or some very dangerous substance that my entire department would have been subject to because of this. Um, I have been called you know, every name in the book. I have had uh, industry-funded front groups try to pressure my university to fire me. Um, uh, I have had uh, very powerful politicians, senators, and uh, committee chairs in the House of Representatives lead what uh, leading newspapers like the Washington Post and the New York Times called a witch hunt, um, aimed directly at me, uh, uh, re demanding you know, all of my personal emails so that they could comb through them and try to find something to attack me with, to discredit me with. Um, I, had um, a run-in with the Attorney General, the previous Attorney General of Virginia, who was uh, what's sometimes called a Tea Party uh, Republican, an extremely conservative uh, Republican um, who had, uh, you know, was driven by a fairly radical ideology. He uh, tried to use a civil subpoena, which is something that is available to the Attorney General to deal with Medicare fraud, um, and he argued that it was perfectly appropriate for him to use this to demand all of my personal emails from the time that I was at the University of Virginia um, because I was working on the science of climate change and he considered that to be fraudulent. Uh, well, it was shot down by the courts, uh, first the lower court. Uh, he appealed it to the state Supreme Court, which um, rejected the case with prejudice, uh, meaning they really never want to see an attorney general come to them with something like this again. Um, but, you know, so in each of these cases, I've, uh, in the end, I've prevailed in these battles, uh, but it takes a lot of time and effort and legal support, um, and I think that's the intent. I think the intent is to distract me, to keep me busy dealing with these various other um, issues and challenges so that I'm not able to do the science that I love doing, so that I'm not able to be out there communicating the science and its implications to the public. Uh, fortunately, I found a way to do those things while still sort of dealing with these additional challenges that I face um, at the center of this uh, campaign to discredit me as a means of discrediting the science of climate change, a very cynical campaign, I might add. In my case, um, the strategy, the d deployment of the Serengeti strategy against me by climate change deniers uh, using tactics like trying to pressure my university um, to, uh, to fire me for uh, uh, various imagined indiscretions, invented indiscretions. Um, uh, that is, you know, part and parcel to a fairly widespread and coordinated effort by you know, special interests, industry special interests, and the various attack dogs and front groups that they fund who are out there harassing any climate scientist now who speaks up, who plays a prominent role in the larger discourse over climate change, uh, they'll find themselves subject to Freedom of Information Act requests, uh, to complaints to their universities. Um, they will 
Uh, in one case, uh, in my case, I have had a fossil fuel industry front group take out an advertisement in our school newspaper attacking me. Um, so they're w really willing to stoop to the lowest and dirtiest of tactics um, in their Machiavellian uh, effort to try to cast doubt and confusion in the public mindset over the issue of human-caused climate change. Yeah, fortunately, I've um, you know, received a lot of support uh, over the years in response to the attacks I've been subject to. Uh, various uh, public policy and, and science organizations have often come to my defense, um, have uh, provided me pro bono legal representation um, when I've been subject to you know, subpoenas from Congress people, from senators. Um, uh, I've been fortunate in that my case has been so high profile that people have come out of the woodwork uh, to help, and that's been really important to me. Uh, help from the outside community, help from members of the scientific community, um, from members of my own university, the support that I get from uh, people who just follow this and, and send me emails and letters thanking me for fighting back against this uh, you know, disinformation effort. So I've received a lot of support, and again, my case is pretty high profile. Uh, what I'm concerned about, more concerned about, is the fact that there are now many younger scientists out there who are doing research on climate change, and when they publish a paper that gets a lot of attention, uh, they're finding themselves subject to these orchestrated attacks. Uh, in many cases, they're just graduate students. They have absolutely no experience in dealing with this sort of issue. And unfortunately, you can't always trust that your university legal counsel will be there to represent you. Um, in many cases, universities will take the path of least resistance and they will give in to these attacks and sometimes you know, throw students and faculty under the bus. Um, so if you find yourself in that situation, it's critical that you find independent uh, support, independent legal counsel, independent advice. Fortunately, because of the history of concerted attacks against climate scientists over the last decade or so, there are many you know, groups and organizations that have uh, come into being that are out there to, uh, to help scientists deal with these challenges. Uh, the Union of Concerned Scientists does a lot of work helping younger scientists cope with the challenges that they find themselves subject to in controversial areas, societally controversial areas of science like climate change. Um, there are groups now like the Climate Science Legal Defense Fund, um, which are there to provide legal support to scientists who f and, you know, find themselves subject to Freedom of Information Act requests. They don't know what their rights are. They can't necessarily trust that their university uh, won't just do the easy thing and, and turn over all their emails. Um, it's really critical that they have independent counsel uh, available to advise them and, and now there exists that infrastructure because you know the scientific community I think recognizes collectively that it's under attack and it's rising to the occasion. It's now fighting back in the form of uh, you know, creating infrastructure for scientists who find themselves uh, attacked and challenged in this way, um, training young scientists to be better communicators. Your best defense against these attacks is to be an effective communicator yourself. Um, and I think it's critical, even aside from the attacks on scientists, it's critical that we be effective communicators because the work that we're doing does have implications for society and there is a role for us to play in trying to communicate those implications to, to society. But it's even more important in this hostile environment that we find ourselves in where you know, often there isn't somebody who's necessarily there to immediately defend you when you're, you, know, you find yourself uh, you know, attacked on some prominent anti-science blog. Uh, what do you do? Well, the best thing to do is to correct the record uh, in objective and uh, you know, terms uh, as calmly as you can uh, to rebut uh, the uh, very you know, accusations and allegations, uh, but then to also turn to others who can help uh, fight back against the attack with you. Yeah, I mean, this is a battle, if you're in this battle, as I said, to communicate climate change in the face of this, uh, you know, hostile, you know, headwind that we face of a very concerted and well-organized um, disinformation effort, uh, you better develop a thick skin and you better be in it for the long haul because this is not 
uh, a battle that's going to end soon. Um, the stakes are too great for the polluting industries. Um, they're going to do everything they can to prevent uh, prospects for putting a price on carbon emissions. Uh, they're going to do everything they can to discredit uh, the growing renewable energy uh, market and um, you know, electric vehicles. Uh, groups like ALEC, uh, which are, it's a front group funded by <clears throat> a number of corporate interests, but uh, primarily uh, associated with the Koch brothers. Um, they are in every state doing everything they can to sabotage um, uh, any legislation uh, that might incentivize clean energy, that might incentivize things like uh, clean vehicle, uh, clean, uh, you know, uh, electric vehicles. Um, they are uh, out there uh, doing everything they can to confuse the public about climate change. Yeah, so, you know, like I said, you, you have to be in it for the long haul and you have to recognize that this is a long-term battle and you're going to lose some skirmishes along the way and don't become discouraged when that happens. Recognize that in the long run, you know, truth will win out. Um, I'm, I'm convinced of that. We've seen that happen in other areas um, where, you know, science has found itself on a collision course with powerful special interests, be it acid rain or you know, uh, the, the threat of pharmaceutical uh, products, um, untested pharmaceutical products, um, ozone depletion, uh, chemical contaminants in our environment, um, on down the list. In every case where the findings of science have conflicted with the interests of powerful corporate interests, powerful special interests, um, those interests have fought back uh, using, you know, the massive resources available to them to discredit the science, to attack the scientists, to muddy the waters, to try to confuse the public, to pressure policymakers um, uh, to not to enact you know, uh, policies that might deal with the problem. Um, so we're in it for the long haul. Recognize that we're going to lose some skirmishes along the way, but I'm you know, firmly convinced that we will win the war uh, because we have one unassailable resource on our side, scientific truth, and there's nothing they can do about that. I was always fascinated with uh, the world of science and problem solving. Um, since I was a, a little kid, I was fascinated about natural phenomena like hurricanes and tornadoes, um, earthquakes, um, living things, uh, nature, um, and so, you know, through high school, uh, I sort of developed uh, an interest in uh, solving problems uh, through computer programming, writing computer programs. Um, I got interested in uh, physics, uh, ended up uh, majoring in physics at UC Berkeley, uh, then uh, double majored in applied math and uh, had prepared to go off into uh, the area of theoretical physics and actually uh, was all but dissertation in theoretical physics at Yale University uh, when I sort of had a, a crisis of scientific uh, uh, or intellectual identity um, and I sort of realized that I, my heart wasn't quite in it um, when it came to the work that I was doing in physics and I saw in the uh, catalog, the Yale Applied Science catalog, that there was a scientist uh, literally just down the hill um, in the uh, Klein Geology Lab uh, who was using physics and math to model the Earth's climate system. And that struck me as a really fascinating uh, classical physics problem. I went to talk with him uh, to see if I might be able to do some research with him for the summer. Uh, that ended up working out and I decided to actually do my PhD with him. Uh, and so I sort of migrated from the field of uh, physics into this very interesting problem which includes physics but includes chemistry and biology and many other disciplines. Uh, the you know, endeavor of uh, modeling and uh, understanding Earth's climate system. I'm always amused uh, by this claim that is made that uh, scientists are in it for the money. Uh, 
when in fact it's actually the folks who are attacking scientists who are being paid quite a bit of money from special interests, from fossil fuel interests, um, in an effort to discredit the science because of its implications for policy. Um, the last thing you would do if you really wanted to make a lot of money is double major in applied math and physics and go off into theoretical physics. Um, uh, and then eventually, of course, into the science of climate. Um, you know, scientists don't go into science for the money. They can make a whole lot more money sort of taking advantage of their uh, knowledge and talents in other areas. Um, you know, you can go to Wall Street and, and, and use a lot of the math that you learn uh, when you're uh, becoming a physicist. Um, there's a, a huge uh, sort of uh, a, a huge number of uh, you know, opportunities um, in the world of banking. Uh, and frankly, uh, if you are a prominent climate scientist, uh, then if you really wanted to make a lot of money, what you would do would be to turn around and start attacking your fellow scientists because you'll be paid a lot of money by special interests. If I were to, for example, um, disown the hockey stick graph, I'm sure I could get paid millions of dollars uh, to do that. I have no interest in that. I wouldn't be able to sleep at night. Um, as a scientist, you have to follow your heart. You have to do what you know is right. You have to follow your scientific curiosity wherever it leads you. Um, and sometimes it leads you into a contentious issue like human-caused climate change, uh, which is the case in, 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 uh, with my story. Um, I sort of underwent this random walk, um, starting out in applied math and physics, eventually going into climate science, uh, pursuing issues in the field of paleoclimatology that ultimately led to the publication of this uh, graph, the hockey stick, this iconic graph, which became sort of a lightning rod in the climate change debate. So I sort of found myself there uh, involuntarily, uh, accidentally, um, in the center of this raging societal debate over human-caused climate change. Despite what you might have heard, this is not new in controversial science. We've known about the greenhouse effect for nearly two centuries. Uh, Joseph Fourier, a scientist who's well known for um, the, uh, the mathematical technique known as the Fourier series, um, he is the same scientist who produced the law of heat conduction. He's the guy behind the law that governs how heat moves through substances. He understood that there was a greenhouse effect, okay? It's two century old science, basic chemistry and physics that we've known for centuries now, nearly centuries. The fact that the earth is warming is undisputable. Uh, we have dozens of lines of evidence that tell us that. The fact that that warming can't be explained by natural causes, again, we have very widespread evidence. And the fact that this will be a problem, that continued warming and climate change will be a problem again, is widely accepted. Even the U.S. military recognizes that this is a problem we have to act on now. If we allow climate change to continue, the globe to get warmer, sea levels to continue to rise um, at unprecedented rates, uh, we will see a fundamental threat to our way of living. Question. Uh, in your book, you talk about a tic-tac-toe program that you <coughs> created back in early in your career. Have you released the code for that program? <laughs> <laughs> that was back in high school. Uh, so, um, you know, that code has, has long disappeared. Thanks, Mike. Did, have you seen somebody say anything about that? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. Uh, in your book, you uh, talk about a tic-tac-toe program you've written. Could you? Did, did you need to release the code for that? Uh, well, it's proprietary.